Hi guys, it's me, Professor D, and welcome back to my YouTube channel. On this video, I'm going to be covering part three of my series on anger and aggression. And to be more specific, I'm going to be going over seclusion and restraints. Before we get started, as always, I'm going to ask you to please support me and help support this channel by liking this video, pressing that thumbs up, by subscribing to my channel if you haven't done so already. And don't forget, I have audio lessons available on my website, nexusnursinginstitute.com. So let's get started. Use of seclusion or restraints. By the way, guys, if you haven't watched part one or part two already, I highly encourage you to do so. You really don't have to watch it in order. However, part one and two will make part three make so much more sense. So I do encourage you to go back and watch those other two parts if you haven't done so already. Now let's take a look. Use of seclusion or restraints. Legally, most courts hold that seclusion and restraints be implemented only when the patient creates a risk to themselves or others. And even when you do use restraints or seclusion, you have to use the most restrictive alternative possible. Okay. When you're studying guys and you see words such as only, Always, never, pay attention, highlight it. That's very important. Let's keep going. Look what it says. I'm going to repeat it because it's important. So legally, most courts hold that seclusion and restraint be implemented only when a patient creates a risk of harm to self or others and no less restrictive alternative is available. And then when you do have a restrictive alternative, you have to try to choose the most, the most least, that really doesn't make sense. You have to try to pick the least restrictive alternative. Okay. We always go guys from least invasive to most invasive. The measures should never be used for punishment or for convenience of the staff. Never. It has to always be to protect that patient from themselves or to protect others from the patient. Seclusion or physical restraint is used only after alternative interventions have been tried. We're going to go from least invasive to most invasive every single time, guys. These interventions include verbal interventions, just you telling that patient, you know, to simmer down, just you telling that patient that that behavior is unacceptable. Offering Offering an as-needed medication. Sometimes just offering that patient a PRN med, you know, maybe they have something PRN for anxiety or whatever it is, just offering them their medication, that may be enough to de-escalate the situation. And it's not, you're not offering that medication as a threat. If they need it, they need it. But offering them that medication can very often is enough to de-escalate the situation. What else? Decreasing sensory stimulation. If that patient's already at 100, do you think they need loud music, loud television, a whole bunch of people talking around them? No, it's only going to escalate um, their emotions and their thought process and how they're perceiving stimuli. No, you want to decrease stimuli. You want to bring them to a quiet place with low lighting, dim lighting, where um, if there is music or TV or radio, it's very, very soft. You want to decrease stimuli. What else? Presence of a significant other. That can be enough to kind of calm them down. Frequent observation. You better be observing your patients frequently, especially the ones who are displaying signs of escalating anger or aggression or hostility or one-on-one -on -one observation with the patient. All of these are tactics that can be used before putting that patient in restraints or seclusion, okay? Seclusion, this refers to the involuntary confinement of a patient alone in a room or area from which the patient is physically prevented from leaving. So the goal of uh, seclu seclusion, guys, again, how many times have we seen this? It's never used as a punishment. It's used to keep the patient safe or others safe, but never as a punishment. The goal of seclusion is safety of the patient and others. Seclusion is less restrictive and restrictive excuse me, seclusion is less restrictive than restraint and it can be helpful in reducing sensory overstimulation. So something that you can do, guys, that is seclusion, you can bring the patient into a room by themselves and leave the door open. Keep your eyes on them. 
restraint. This is defined as any manual method. So physically restraining them, physical or mechanical material or equipment that immobilizes or reduces the ability of the patient to move his or her arms, legs, or body. Chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, spinal injury, seizure disorders, and pregnancy are examples of contraindicated problems. And what they're talking about, guys, are contraindications for seclusion and restraint. Look at what it says here. Patients who have extremely unstable medical and psychiatric conditions are not considered safe candidates for these treatments. Again, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. They have breathing issues. They may work themselves up to the point that they start to hyperventilate. Or they have uh, um, uh, uh, their breathing disorder has been exacerbated. Spinal injury, seizure disorder, pregnancy. Let's keep going. Delirium or dementia may make seclusion and restraint intolerable due to the absence of stimulation. Um, you guys know this. I've gone over dementia already. Uh, those patients who have dementia, they have to have that type of stimulation. Very often the tactile stimulation, they want to pick at things. So you give them things such as a uh, button so they can keep buttoning and unbuttoning or I forget what you call them. Um, Velcro, Velcro, where they can keep sticking and unsticking the Velcro, right? They need that type of stimulation. These restrictive measures should be avoided in patients who are overtly suicidal and those who require monitoring for severe drug reactions or overdoses, because they might use that situation of the seclusion to go ahead and carry out their plan. A patient may not be held in seclusion or restraint without an order from a licensed practitioner. Although in emergency situations, the order can be received after the fact, and it needs to be immediately. You put that patient in restraints, you immediately call and get that order. Once in restraint, a patient must be directly observed and formally assessed at frequent intervals for the levels of awareness, the level of activity, safety within the restraints, hydration, toileting needs, nutrition, and comfort. So let's talk about this. While that patient's in restraints, you have to continually monitor and document that you monitored them for um, toileting needs. How often did you offer them to go to the bathroom? document how often it was offered to them because you have to prove that you offered it to them and what the response was. How often you offered water or juice or whatever that form of hydration to the patient was, make sure you document it. Make sure if you know their upper extremities are restrained, that you're doing a physical assessment. You're looking for color. You're looking for pulse. You're looking for warmth. You want to make sure there's not too much pressure. You have to assess that patient and you have to document that you did so. So all of these that you see here, right here, all of these guys, you have to document. Their level of consciousness, you have to assess that and document that you assess that. And guess what? The minute that patient no longer poses a harm to themselves or others, you have to release them from the restraints. You can't keep them in the restraints just because. You have to document um, the reason that they're still in restraints. So you have to document your assessment on that patient, what's causing them to still not be safe from the restraints. The team leader is the only person talking to the patient to decrease stimuli. If there are five different people on the healthcare team that are talking to that patient, you think that's going to increase or de decrease stimulation? It's going to increase stimulation. We're trying to decrease it. So only the team leader. The patient must be given every opportunity to regain control so that the least restrictive method can be used. Maybe they're not ready to go join everybody in a day room, but we can take them out of restraints and maybe they can just hang out in their room. If restraints are to be used, the patient is informed at this point of the team's intent and the reason for the action. And you have to tell the patient what it is that they have to display in order for them to be deemed safe from themselves and others to get out of the restraints. You can't just restrain the patient, them not know why they're restrained, and them not know what they have to do in order to get out of the restraints. The team remains calm and acts as quick as possible. While the patient's in seclusion or restraint, 
Close monitoring to determine the patient's ability to reintegrate into the unit activities is what? Mandatory. That means absolutely, in, absolutely essential. You have to let that patient um, uh, know what behavior is expected before they can get out of those restraints. If the reintegration if the reintegration proves to be too much for the patient and results in increased agitation, the individual is returned back to the room or another quiet area. So you put them out of the restraints and you tell them what it is that they have to display to be able to go back to the day room or go back to where everyone else is. And they display that behavior and you bring them back, but it's too much for them and they start to escalate. Guess what? You're going to bring them back to the room, not back to restraints. Always, guys, we're going to go from least invasive to most invasive. Patients must be able to follow commands and control behaviors before reintegration can occur. And that reintegration is just being able to go back to where everyone else is freely. All right, let's talk about mechanical restraints. Guidelines for use of mechanical restraints. I'm not going to go over all of them, guys. You see them here, press pause, make sure you read them, make sure you understand them. I'm going to go over the ones that show up most for uh, tests so you guys can know, but make sure you know all of them because I don't write your test. All right, observation. You're going to complete written record every 15 minutes. You're going to monitor their vital signs, assess range of uh, movement. You want to make sure they're not extreme experiencing any paralysis of the extremity, any pain, any paresthesia. Do these P's sound uh, familiar? Decreased circulation compartment syndrome? Okay. Observe blood flow in the hands and feet. And over here on the side, I wrote do neuro check. You're gonna do a neuro check on your patient. You're gonna provide nutrition. You're gonna offer them food. You're gonna offer them hydration and you're gonna document every time you do that. You're gonna provide nutrition, hydration and elimination food, water, drinks, and how often you offer for them to go to the bathroom. Release procedure, debrief with the patient. Now, this is very important. You have to have a conversation with the patient about what led up to that moment that they had to go in restraints. What went wrong? What was the unacceptable behavior that caused this to happen? And what is the plan moving forward when you come out of the restraints? What is the plan moving forward when you're reintegrated and your anxiety starts to increase? What is the plan? Restraint tips. Physical holding of a patient against will is a restraint. That is considered a restraint. Four side rails up is a restraint except in seizure precautions. Obviously, if we're seizure, seizure precautions, we're going to have those side rails up. But other than that, Four of them is considered a restraint. Keeping patient in his or her room by physical intervention is seclusion. Tucking sheets in so tightly that the patient can't move, that's considered a restraint. Orders for seclusion or restraint cannot be as needed. It has to have a specific time. And usually the rest, um, um, if a patient is in restraints, it is only good for 24 hours and that re that order has to be renewed, but it's not as needed. Immediately, immediately after the seclusion or restraint episode, the staff must engage in debriefing with one another. Staff analysis of the episode of violence referred to as critical incident debriefing is crucial. It is very important for many reasons. First, are reviews necessary to ensure that the quality care was provided to the patient. And staff members need to critically examine their response to the patient. Okay, what did we do? What could we have done better? What mistakes were made? What can we avoid doing next time? Questions to be answered include the following. Could we have done anything that would have prevented the episode? Did the team respond as a team? How do staff members feel about the patient? Is there a need for additional staff education regarding how to respond to violent patients? How did the actual restraining process go? If injury occurred, has it been reported and cared for? 
the nurse must provide documentation in situations in which violence was, I, was either averted or it actually occurred, including the file, following. And I'm not going to go over all of them, but you see this list, so just pause to read. Behaviors that occurred as the patient was escalating. That is important to know because those type of behaviors, if you know that in the patient again, you can realize, okay, I think they're starting to escalate. Let me keep an eye on this patient. Let me make sure my other patients are protected. Detailed description of the patient's behaviors during the assaultive stage. Observation of the patient and interventions performed while the patient was in restraints and or seclusion. So make sure you guys pause to read because all of those are important things that need to be documented. Last, let's go over the interventions for anger control assistance. I'm not going to go over all of them, guys. Just press pause to read. To read, establish basic trust and rapport with the patient. And that's where therapeutic communication comes in. If they don't trust you, you are the enemy, okay? Use calm, reassuring approach. Limit access to frustrating situations. If, you know, the patient cannot control their behavior, you need to limit access to frustrating situations for that patient until they can. Monitor potential for inappropriate aggression and intervene before it actually becomes expressive. So you know this, that patient's starting to pace. You see their hands starting to do this, or they start starting to do this, or they start talking to themselves um, in an aggressive fashion, or you can see on um, their affect, you can see on their face that they're getting upset. You need to intervene before they walk up to somebody and punch them, right? Prevent physical harm if anger is directed at self or others. Restraint and removal of potential weapons. Use external controls such as physical or manual restraints, timeouts, seclusion as needed to calm the patient who's expressing anger in a maladaptive behavior. And so, guys, that is it for part three of this video. Part four coming soon. Part four is the last part of the series. If you haven't watched part one or two, again, I encourage you to watch it. It will make much more sense. As always, I encourage you, please let me know in the comment section what you thought about this video, what you'd like to see me cover next or more extensively. Don't forget, I have audio lessons available on my website. And guys, another way you guys can uh, support this channel, if you could maybe post my video on your social media platform so someone else who's in the nursing program or maybe they graduated and they're studying for the NCLEX, maybe they didn't know about me, but then watching my video, it can help them. So I'm asking you to please support my channel in any way you can. Thank you so much for watching this video and you guys will catch me on the next video.